Hi, I'm graphic novelist Jarrett J. Krasowska, and welcome to Origin Stories. In this episode, we're going to get to know how Jerry Craft became multi-award winning. Jerry <laughs> Origin Stories with JJK. Jarrett Krasowska. Jerry Craft. Hello, hey, Jerry. How are you, man? Jared, I, I can't imagine how thrilled you must be. Dude, this is <laughs> such an honor for me. I'm t- <laughs> we were talking before we went live about how awkward it is when you might be interviewed for something. And, you know, everyone's like, oh, it's, it's an honor to be here. But how funny it would be if, like, you know, it's a really big deal for you that I am on your show. <laughs> which, which, Jerry, and honestly, it really is a big deal that you're you're on this podcast because, um, granted, we, we go way back, but... You know, you're a Newbery Medal Award winning author, uh, Credit Scott King, Credit Scott King, uh, writer, medal. Uh, you're appearing on so many different cable news programs lately. Uh, but you'll always be, to me, the, the Jerry Craft who had a table next to me. I want to say it was 2009. 2010 oh, at a, a library God. conference you know the story we were it was either the massachusetts library conference or the uh, connecticut library conference and we it had was like to, msla something like that uh, so i want to say it was msla which was massachusetts which still is massachusetts school library association so you yeah. had a collection of your, your mama boys mama's boys uh the, the strips the treasuries i had the first <laughs> lunch lady book few picture books uh and we sat there uh and people came by our, our tables throughout the evening and they smiled politely and they picked up our books and then they awkwardly would put the books back at the table <laughs> kind of avoid contact eye contact but then smile and, and then and then walk away uh but through that I, I, we got to be pals and that, that's how we met. And, um, I, I judge I judge men based on the, the, the level of their, the, the, I, I base guys on whether or not they're a good dad. Okay. And, and we just oh. talked about kids and you immediately were talking about your boys and, yep. and, and there they are. And there uh, they are. There they are. You, they were probably around that age when um, when we first met. Uh, but they're a lot older now, aren't they? They are 24 and 22 now. Wow, that's wild. And so, so yeah. yeah, so we were, you know, just a couple of scrappy kids with some comics that no one cared to really look at. <laughs> and yeah. here we are now on a podcast together. <laughs> All these years later. Up, oh wow! What, what a nice hobby this must be for you guys. Like, no, we, we do this for a living. And then yeah. too, I mean, I'm not sure how many if if you had a lot of these conversations with folks one on one, but even then, in 2009, yeah. there were there were people, and believe it or not, librarians who would say, "I just don't think graphic novels are right to have at school. Yeah. That's not that's not a real book." Right. If you ever write a real book, here's my card. Let me know. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, before we get into how you got into making comics professionally, I want to know a little bit about uh, this kid on the far right. Uh-huh. Tell, tell, tell us, yep. tell us, tell us, tell us about young Jerry Craft, please. And have... tell us about yeah. your life. Tell us about like what was your home like, where did you live, what was your family set up, did did adults support you in your reading of comics? What was what was that like for you? What was it like for you as a kid? So you know, a lot of it is Jordan Banks. For the most part, I was Jordan Banks, the protagonist from New Kid. The house where Jordan lives is the house where I grew up. So that photo that you saw that you just showed. Yep, that's it. Uh, so I'm sitting on the porch with, with my buddies and we were kind of like the little rascals. And for the most part, wherever I was, you know, I had straight hair and my skin was lighter. Uh, in school, I was a year younger always than everyone in my class. 
and uh you know i was smaller i didn't get my growth spurt until like 11th grade so 11th grade through i'd say about 21 i grew maybe six inches mm -hmm. but i was like five four up until 11th grade so really late bloomer um always loved comic books and my atari 2600 always wanted to be an artist my parents had only ever heard the term starving artist so they were like yeah maybe not you know so they wanted me to do it as a hobby but not necessarily as a living because they thought that the only living i would be doing as a professional artist is living in the basement of the brownstone until i was 50 years old <laughs> um i think the only art uh, or artist that you even knew of was Darren from Bewitch. You know, I think he was an art director at an ad agency. Uh, but everyone else they thought was just selling paintings of bulldogs playing poker, uh, <laughs> you know, in the, out of the trunk of the car in the village. And that was not a life that they wanted uh, for their son. So I had taken the test when I graduated from St. Matthew's Lutheran School in Inwood. I took the test for both music and art and art design. I passed them both. And my mom was like, yeah, you know, there's a school in Riverdale called Fieldston where you can get a real education and get a real job. So you're going to go there. And that was the start of my life as Jordan Banks, the new kid. What did your parents do? Like, what was their vocation? Uh, my dad worked for the post office for like, I don't know, like 40 years. It was one of those where, you know, he never missed a day when, uh, no, actually there was like twice in my life. I remember him taking a sick day and that just sent panic throughout the house. I was like, oh my God, dad's going to die. <laughs> You know, like he just never missed work. So when he retired, he had like six months accrued vacation days, wow. you know? So he, he retired like six months earlier than he could have, you know, than he should have, but he had all this paid vacation. My mom always worked for the city. Uh, so she worked for like Mayor John Lindsay's office and she knew uh, Carl McCall, who eventually became governor and, you know, like, uh, or what, he, yeah, I forgot exactly what he was. Um, so she always had these like jobs downtown in Canal Street and Chamber Street down there. And, but my dad's idea was basically, you know, you get a job, you stay there for 30 years, you get a gold watch and you retire. Hmm. Uh, so there was no sense of, you know, being an entrepreneur or upward mobility or, you know, just finding your passion, whatever. It was like, do it and suck it up. And just, you know, 30 years later, you retire. So that, that was kind of my, that was kind of mindset that I had to break out of. Mm. And that's, and it, and it is a lot for a parent to wrap their brain around, you know, if that's how your, your dad knew how to make a living and provide for everyone. And you the way your mom was was bringing income into the house as well you you may as well have said i i want to travel to outer space because uh -huh. like like you you know i my my grandfather had a very blue collar job and he just he didn't get it and he was afraid right he like you know like your parents were afraid of how is this kid possibly going to support himself we need him to grow yeah. up and spread his well, wings. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll get a little Dr. Phil on you. My dad, you know, my dad uh, told the story of being in the Merchant Marines in uh, Port Arthur, Texas, and drank out of a white water fountain uh, accidentally and was like chased back to his ship and, you know, like that kind of thing. So, you know, it was a whole different uh, era back then. Um, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's that different now, but for a while, it seemed like it was very different. And to have that person that was, you know, that lived that life and was, you know, really never thought of to be 
equal or good enough. You know, he had a lot of stuff like that. That was just like, you know, you put your head down and you just go and you, you do your job and you don't make waves, that kind of thing. Uh, my mom was a little bit better at that than he was, you know. So I got kind of the, the work ethic um, from him, but then the sense of belonging or, you know, if you work harder that you're just as good or you can be better or that kind of thing from mom. So it was a, a pretty good, um, you know, double influence that I got that helped me to to get to where I am. Yeah. And I think that is the recipe for success and, and whatever you might want to do, but especially if you have to carve your own path is one to feel yeah. like you're, you're deserving of it, right? That, that you are, you know, are, are just as able as anyone else to do this. Uh, but the work ethic, uh, you uh -huh. have to pull some long hours and you have to hustle. I mean, you and I were both sitting at those tables chatting in between, but that, that was a part of our hustle, which was, Kind of, you sometimes feel like a you know encyclopedia salesman where you're just going door to door with a suitcase suitcase full of books. Yeah, you know, I remember with my first Mama's Boys book, I self published because I could not get traditionally published, and I gave up on being traditionally published in 1997. I started my own publishing company, and I published my first book, Mama's Boys, as American the Sweet Potato Pie. 1997, I think I bought 2,500 copies. It cost maybe $5,000. And then I had 2,500 copies of a book that I had no idea how to sell. Yeah. So it was in the trunk of my car and, you know, trying to go to book fairs and then you go to book fair and, you know, you come back with 2,499, you know, the <laughs> one that we probably swapped with each other, you know? <laughs> And, um, you know, so there was a lot, it was putting in your own money. It was driving up, it was being hopeful. It was coming back rejected, but how do you build up to be hopeful the next time? So, I mean, from 97, it wasn't until 2014 that I got offered to illustrate the zero degree zombie zone for scholastic that I had quote unquote, a real publisher behind me but mm -hmm. it was a long you know you talk about pushing a boulder uphill for you know almost 20 years um there was a there was a lot of that so so what what happened then what happened in the time between you know being a teenager living with your parents to then self-publishing mama's boys in 97 like it's a big it's a big chunk of time there like what kind of what kind of stuff were you doing well, after I graduated from Fieldston, which is the school in Riverdale, which I changed to Riverdale Academy Day School in New Kid, I did get to go to School of Visual Arts. So I did finally go to an art school. And, you know, they had cartoonists such as Will Eisner and Harvey Kurtzman and, you know, some really legendary cartoonists, but I only really knew Marvel guys. You know, like if that had been Jack Kirby or John Buscema or Gene Colan, I'd be like, oh, great. But, you know, these guys were doing indie stuff and graphic novels and it wasn't superhero stuff. Mm -hmm. So I really didn't know who they were. Um, so as a result, I did not think that the line would be, you know, out the placement office and around the corner trying to get to their classes. So as a result, the whole four years where I was in School of Visual Arts, I didn't take any, I couldn't get into any cartooning classes. So I never took any cartooning. Um, I ended up majoring in advertising copywriters. So I did become like Darren from uh, Bewitch, yeah. you know? And um, so I, I graduated and I was an ad copywriter. So I wrote radio commercials, a couple of TV spots, a lot of print ads. And I did that for eight years at a place called Lowendowski Enterprises. It's, you know, it's a very small agency. And then I went to another one called McNamara Clap and Klein, where I wrote uh, uh, a few things there. And then in the early 90s, you know, so it, this is Mad Men. This is me being Don Draper, you know, that, that concept of Madison Avenue. 
And then the early nineties, the ad business just, just disintegrated. And now I would go for a job and I'm like, is that my teacher also dropping off his portfolio? <laughs> you know, so that was kind of scary. And I remember going for an interview at Gray Advertising and this woman says, oh my goodness, this is so great. I'm going to call a friend of mine. She calls up and I'm sitting right there and she's like, hey, John, listen, um, I have this young copywriter here. It's one of the best I've seen. What advice can you give? Oh, he says to get out of the business now while you can. And it was like, wah, wah, wah. You know, like, <laughs> I've been going to school for this and you're telling me to get out of business. So I went back to the placement office at School of Visual Arts and they uh, said that there was a woman who was looking for an art assistant and she was doing comics for Marvel. And I was like, oh my goodness, I finally get to work on Spider-Man. And I get there and it's a woman named Barbara Slate and she tells me that she is doing kind of like Archie in ancient Rome. It was a series called Sweet 16. And she needed someone to help with the backgrounds and, you know, things like that. And so I looked at my brother and sister's all Archie comics. And I spent the weekend drawing Archie. And I went there Monday morning with a brand new portfolio. And I got the job. And then I worked with Barbara Slate for maybe three years, you know, doing the backgrounds for Sweet 16, uh, New Kids on the Block comics. No, uh, you were, you yeah. worked on the New Kids on the Block comics. Cold chilling. <laughs> well, you you had the right stuff, Jerry. You had the yeah, see, right new, stuff. From New Kids on the Block to New Kid, right? See? see that's, a, that's an amazing detail about your trajectory. That was not in your Newberry Medal acceptance speech. Yep, yep. So yeah, it was, um, yeah, New Kids on the Block. Uh, and then we did, uh, she did um, <sighs> Yuppies from Hell, which is a graphic novel. So that was one of the first graphic novels I had seen. I think one of the first ones I read was Why I Hate Saturn by Kyle Baker. And, I, and it, it was, so it's one of the first non-superhero books I had ever read. And I was like, wow, I love this. This is cool. You know, I hadn't read the Will Eisner stuff yet, you know, mm. and then Barbara did um, Yuppies from Hell. And then we did the sequel to that. And um, then after there, um, I had created a comic strip called Mama's Boys. And while I was working with Barbara, I sent it into King Features trying to get syndicated because it was basically like five syndicates. It was like, United, Universal, King Features, uh, Tribune, and like LA Times. So those four controlled everything. And and, and and people should know too that most of those are legacy strips. And so yeah. being your Garfield, your 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 blondies and and in a lot of those situations, like uh even if the cartoonist has been doing this for so many decades and grows old and dies then the children of that cartoonist keeps it going. Yes. So it's so hard, Blondie, hard to break into right. that. Right. So Blondie had been around since like the 1930s. Like Blondie was a, what they call like a flapper or something. She's like a showgirl. Yeah. You like know, that sold, was sold cigarettes, and, like candy, cigarettes, candy, cigarettes. Yeah. yeah. And Dagwood, <laughs> Dagwood came from a wealthy family and he falls in love with Blondie. And his parents are basically like, look, if you marry that flapper, we're cutting you off. And he marries her because she's beneath him, you know, and they cut him off. And then, you know, years later, it, it changed and people forget about that. But that had been around, you know, since the 30s. And, you know, Henry and some of these strips, Flash Gordon that my friend Jim Keefe ended up taking over. Um yeah, and you're right. When they die or whatever, they hire someone else to do Popeye. And so, you know, each one would maybe, each syndicate would maybe take on four or five new strips a year to see if any of them, you know, could stick around. But for the most part, it was, you know, uh, Peanuts and um, 
you know, Lynn Johnston with For Better, For Worse, and like Calvin and Hobbes would come and that was like a big thing and Farside. And my job at King Free, so I ended up getting hired there as an intern one day a week. And I got to work on these comic strips. So like if there was a mistake made, like, you know, one panel Dagwood has on short sleeves and next panel he has on long sleeves, I'd have to go in and fix the art. Or if there were spelling errors, I'd, you know, make a copy or photo stand and put wax on it and cut it with my exacto blade and fix the lettering or reformat the Prince Valiant strips or handicap, I'd have to reformat and make Sundays. And Jerry, so why, Jerry, why didn't you, why didn't you just use Photoshop? Wouldn't that have been easier? Yeah, right. I remember when we, we <laughs> first got, I'd been there maybe three years before we got like one Mac Quadra. And, and like, that was for the whole art department to share. We had to go, all right, I need it from one to two tomorrow. Okay. Okay. You can use the, yeah, it was, it was so weird. You know, and that that was just kind of, and then I I used my copywriting skills. So then when we um, uh, launched new comic strips, like we did one called Mallard Fillmore about uh, a mallard, a duck, like how the duck, you know, he was political working in DC. And my headline was like the most controversial bill ever to hit Washington. <laughs> it is Bill, you like it there. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> You know, and, and we launched Mutts and Zits. They're still around. Uh, a lot of the strips only were like four months and they would get canceled. And it was like literally back to the drawing board. But I got to meet, you know, Mort Walker. And, and Mort Walker and Mort Walker did uh, Beetle Bailey, right? Beetle Bailey. Yeah. Beetle Bailey. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, the Brown family did Hake of the Horrible. And then I think they did High and Lowest together. So, and then Ray Bill has even did Curtis, who, um, you know, just won the Rubin Award, which is a really big deal. Congratulations, Ray Billingsley. And so I stayed there for eight years, working in the comic art department and writing brochures and things like that. So it was, it was cool. I got to meet a lot of artists there. You really cut your teeth. I mean, that's, that's your master's degree in comics right there. Yeah, it really was. It really was to go out to lunch with Fred Laswell, who did the Barney Google strip. And he's like, hey, come on, I'm taking that one to the Palm restaurant. I'm like, okay, that's the only way I'll ever get there. <laughs> you know? Um, I mean, yeah, I'm, it was, it was I, you know, I, 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 I don't know this story. And so it's, it's rattling around in my brain. And, and for me, you know, it's really connecting the dots of that transition of, you know that the 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 olden days of comic strips and what graphic novels are like now because yeah. I, I think it's really it's probably such a i know it's a foreign concept for young readers today to to even grasp the thought that when when you and i were young readers when we were kids and we wanted to pick up a comic it was the comic strips in the newspaper or marvel uh -huh. and dc comics and that's all that we had access to. I mean, there were no graphic right. novels being published for, for kids, no original no. stories like we have no. now. And no. uh, and then at, at some point, like like you got exposed to and I got exposed to at some point that, whoa, comics can be something different than a superhero story or a three panel gag. And, you know, and there there is, of course, there is there is a place for those right. comics as well, but it can it's an art form that can be so much more. Um, and I'm just, you know, my brain is just yeah. racing now thinking of the people you met and where you are now. Um, you know, and so, and so that's, so this is all how you became an overnight success with new kid. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was a piece of cake, <laughs> you know? Um, so from King features, um, I got my mama's boys comics to syndicated weekly. So it was part of this thing called the weekly package that they had that had original comic strips like mine. It had the classics like, you know, Flash Gordon and Henry. And um, then they had like car columns and astrology columns. So if you owned a newspaper, you could subscribe to that and you get a stack of stuff and you take whatever you want and throw out the rest, you know? So it went to 1500 papers 
I have no idea how many papers actually use Mama's Boys. Um, so then I left there in uh, 97, I think, and got a job at Sports Illustrated for Kids. I had taught myself website, website design and I got hired as an online producer, producer for the Sports Illustrated for Kids website. That's a, that's very like, forward yeah. thinking in 1997. Very forward thinking yeah. to, to to you know to, to the, even the thought that you know a legacy media company like Sports Illustrated might need that resource. So so that goes to you know that that hard work and hustle that you were you were raised with, right? There's a yeah. connection there. Yeah. And you know we used to get uh, companies sending us toys and books and things like that and i remember one day getting a advanced reader copy uh it wasn't even stapled it, it definitely it was just like you know a draft and I said hey monkey boy <laughs> or, yeah good night monkey boy good, good night, night monkey, monkey boy. boy yes and i i remember that from years ago and it wasn't until maybe six months ago that somehow it came up and I was like, wait a minute, Jerry Koscheska, I had no idea that was yours. Yeah. So think of, think of the universe bringing us together where, you know, my, my first published book made it to your desk at sports illustrated kids. And, and so your, your guys, yeah. they must've been, they must've been real little then. Yeah, they were. So 97 98 i mean jay was born in 98 so he was smaller than little yeah <laughs> you know, aaron was born to 2000 so they were by the time i saw that wh when was that published when would i have seen that 2001 yeah so yeah jalen was like three and per aaron was a baby age. so i yeah. brought it home and, and read it because we always yeah we always did bedtime stories because you know the deal the thing is I hated to read, you know, with the exception of Spider-Man and Silver Surfer. And even then I would kind of skip the, uh, the part when he was Peter Parker talking to Aunt May and gets the, the fight scenes, you know, yeah. you insolent adult, I will crush you. You know, I get to that part where he's fighting Craven the Hunter, Dr. Octopus. Um, my teachers thought that reading comics would rot your brain, that they were just silly and worthless. Yeah. So they would confiscate your comic books to keep you from reading it. And then, so I learned early off that, early on that uh, reading was never for enjoyment because the stuff that I enjoyed, my teachers didn't want me to do. And uh, that's why I'm so concerned now with the whole book banning thing is that there are so many people that are gravitating to new kid and Hey kiddo. And, you know, so many other great books, you know, Kelly Yang's books and, you know, and it's like, wow, I love these. Yeah. Yoink. <laughs> you know, we're going to lock yeah. these up, you know, yeah. and it's like, okay, so what, is, you know, it's not like they're going to then go and read, Oh, let me read cats in the rye again. They're gonna go on TikTok, right? Oh, that's you know? so true. Yeah, they're not gonna go like, well, I guess Dick and Jane are is safe, you right. know. Some, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. It, it, it gets your it gets your dog heated. Dog, your beagle is heated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My my beagles go off whenever they hear of book banning. I haven't trained for that. That's good. Yeah, that's okay. good. <laughs> Dexter, it, Dexter, it's okay. They they reinstated my book. It's okay. <laughs> It's reinstated. Oh. I know. I know. Yeah. So yeah, he'll okay. be okay. So so th that must have so that experience for you growing up must have informed the kind of dad you became to to your your boys then, right? About reading. Yeah, I I um I wanted them to have the love of books that I never had, yeah. and so. I'll be honest, like, I could read, but in my mind, reading was only for information. So I could read a 500 page book 
on how to use Adobe Photoshop or Flash or, um, you know, like some of these computer programs, director and, you know, so I, I could read that or, you know, finances or things like that. But the concept of sitting down with a book for enjoyment was not something that I did until I was literally a grown man with kids. Hmm. What kind of books did your kids like? Like what kind of books did you have to read over and over and over again that you were, that you'd be psyched about when they were reading, you read um, it over, they were like, what do they gravitate towards? Besides a good night monkey. I am, course, that was a pillar in their education. I, I, said, <laughs> um, I am a master at reading Fox and Socks by Dr. Seuss. Nice. Um, even with the alliteration, I'm a near professional at that. So that was one, you know, the Horton Hears a Who. I'll, I'll, we, were, we were big Dr. Seuss guys, you know. Um, and then Captain Underpants came into the picture. Aaron was a Geronimo Stilton guy. And then Jalen, as he got a little older, mouse guard, he got into bone on his own. Um, yeah, no, yeah. no offense to Jeff Smith. Yeah. Jeff, well, you we're, said we're bone. Sorry. He thought he, he right. you said the word bone. It's a good oh, thing there's bone. no graphic right, novel called this. Good Boy Gets a Treat. Right. Come in. No, no bones. So, um, all right, calm down. Uh, Betty didn't uh, do that. I bet your dog didn't do that to Don Lemon when you're on his show. Right, exactly. <laughs> there you go. Um, it's a beautiful so, dog. Beautiful yeah, so dog. then um, they discovered a uh, wimpy kid on their own. And that's when they just it went to a whole new level. Now I had read um, things like The Wizard of Oz, like who knew that that was a book? You know, so I was like, wow, Wizard of Oz is a book, huh? Oh, I don't, yeah. I, I don't know that I knew that Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was a book until I got to high school. Yeah, Wizard of Oz is dark. Yeah, it is. <laughs> you know, it there's some dark stuff. And then um, I remember Bud Not Budding by Christopher Paul Curtis. And that was a book that had these two little shiny stickers on it. And I was like, huh, I have no idea what those are, but it must mean it's a good book. So then I, when I would go to this school library, I would look for those two little shiny stickers. And we got like holes and, you know, I was like, oh, okay, that's a sign that, okay. So I would go and look for those stickers. And then... Uh, Yep, yep, I know, I know, I know. Um, and then after that, you know, so, but Wimpy Kid was what did it for them because I had never seen, like, everyone in their class is walking around hugging a book. And my kids were like, Dad, we have to go to the store on August 11th. And I'm thinking they mean GameStop to pick up the new Sonic or something. I'm like, and they're like, no, we got to go to the bookstore. To get the new Wimpy Kid, I'm like, you know when a book is coming out? Like, yeah. that was, I had never heard of that. Like, the first book birthday I was aware of is when New Kid came out, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 2019. That was the first time I knew when a book was coming out. Um, and then they went to Percy Jackson, and they were the same with that. And so they're they're readers. So there, so there again, like that's like your second master's degree in literature. So you spent all yep. of those years uh, working at the syndicate, and now you are you, you're you're getting on the floor with your kids, and you're reading, and you're supporting them, and you're 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 following they their lead on their interests. Yeah. And wow, that changed your life, yep. didn't it? It did. It really did. But it also showed me that. You know, there weren't a lot of books with African-American protagonists that were on the level of Wimpy Kid, where it was this kind of 
mindless fun. Yes. You know, like a lot of the ones that I got, you know, it was it was the the big trifecta. It was slavery, civil rights, or um, police or gangs, you know. And I'm like, where's the like just the fun book of you know goofing around and eating pizza and playing video games and that kind of thing. And then, um, so out of the blue, so I, I was still self-publishing. And then one day I was like, I don't think I can do this anymore because, you know, I was always having to do a book for someone, right? I, I was, I started my own publishing company and then I worked with other authors to publish their books. So I would draw it, you know, color it, do the layout, uh, get the ISBN number, the barcode, upload it to a printer. So I was like full service wow. and did that for like 20 years and did eh, two to three dozen books, you know, that I, I worked on. You're a one man um, band. You were like the dude who's got like, you know, like the guitar and the kazoo yes. and the drums. Right. right. And the and the symbols and yep and yeah. i would that's what i was doing it, it was it was a lot you know and i was like i always have to be doing something and then i always had to be going to book fairs with like now i would go with 15 different titles and you know it was rough so i reached out to someone that i knew in publishing i said i need to know some real people you know like this self-publishing thing is a lot, you know, it taught me a lot. And so she introduced me uh, via email to three people and I sent out query letters and I got, you know, very polite uh, rejections. And then um, about three months later, it was like March of like maybe 2012. Uh, I got an email. Hey, why don't you come in to meet with us? And I'm like, oh, okay. And it was at Scholastic. And I went in and I had like every book I ever did. And I go in, I'm a one man show and I'm juggling and saying and dancing and doing my whole spiel. And, just, and I do it. And I'm like, ta-da. And they're like, so what else you got? I'm like, what do you mean what else? <laughs> that's, the, I, that's the show. That's it. That's the show, you know. Good night. I'll be here all week, you know, <laughs> trying to deal. And um, they were like, have you ever thought of doing a middle grade graphic novel? And I said, well, you know, I have one loosely based on my life of being one of the few kids of color in a predominantly white private school. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they all kind of sit up, like, go on. And... Um, so they were like, oh, now I had planned to self-publish it. But the only thing is for me to self-publish a 200-page book in full color, I would have had to probably pay like $12 a unit yeah. for me. So I'd have to charge like $30 because it's very expensive, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so it probably wasn't something that was going to happen. Um and then they were like, oh, why don't you do up some samples? So I did it up and they liked it. And I just did more and more. And then um, they said, have you ever read Smile by Raina Telgemeier? I said, no. And they, they go to the vault, you know, and open up and the angels come out and the light shines <laughs> down. <laughs> and all of the angels have braces. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> And they make me wash my hands and, you know, they hand it to me and I open it up and it was like, smile by Raina Telgemeier. And I took it home and I read it and I went, oh, now I know what I want to be when I grow up. And how, how old, how old are you? Cause that's what I, I, I love, I, I love like just cementing for the listeners that, you know, you don't like, you don't have to know what you exactly want to be when you grow up until whatever. How, how old were you when you came to that epiphany? I was like 40. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was not a kid, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's, and that's an amazing story, an amazing trajectory. Cause you had 
20 years behind you of all of these other life experiences that were building up to this moment yeah. to become an overnight success. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, I want to be Randy Telgemeier. Okay. Mm. And then a few months later, uh, Andre Davis Pinckney from Scholastic reached out uh, and asked me if I wanted to illustrate the Zero Degree Zombie Zone, which I did. And then I got on my first like press junket kind of thing, going with Patrick Henry Bass, who's the author. They sent me to BEA, Book Expo of America, which is in New York. And I had always gone there, but I had gone as the guy with his suitcase looking for free books, you know, and <laughs> went to meet authors. So it was really, it was, it was like, mind blowing to be on the other side of the table with a line of people you know that was like you know in a in a scholastic booth like that was unreal and then i illustrated that and then they sent me to the national book festival and then that was when i met Raina telgemeier um i met um jean yang um uh, and so Patrick, Henry Bass, and I go on first, right? We're in this auditorium. And there's like 50 people. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, my people, our people leave. And I look up and now there's like 200 little girls hugging Raina Telgemeier's book. So she comes on next. And it's like, wow, okay. And then she leaves and I'm staying there. And then there's like 340 year old men with um oh man what's the name of that book um they made a movie out of it where it's like the seven ex-girlfriends seven scott ex pilgrim, scott pilgrim. Scott pilgrim. Mm -hmm. right so now Brian, it's like Brian leo melly yes so now right it's him and now it's like 340 year old men hugging their books and i'm like this is weird like who knew that people love books like this you know, and it was every age group. And then after that, I think it was like Jeff Smith. And then it was like Jeff Kenny. And then they all signed together. And that, the the hallway was just mobbed with thousands of these book-loving people. And it was like, that was eye-opening. I was like, this is a real business. <laughs> like, who knew? You know, um, it, I, yeah. And then um, we ended up, uh, so I ended up getting an agent, you know, because um, Scholastic really liked the book and I, got, I was able to get an agent. And then we ended up selling it to um, Andrews McNeil, which was one of the uh, publishers that I had used, that I had tried to sell my Mama's Boys book to because Andrews McNeil specialized in those kind of treasury editions those like mm -hmm. anthologies of like mm -hmm. far side and Calvin Gar Hall, garfield or garfield or... and ziggy that was all Andrew mcmeal and they had a um an imprint that had like new stuff you know so they signed me for their imprint that had like the new stuff and now I'm like, I got my contract for New Kid. So I'm drawing, drawing, drawing. And I have until like April of 2016 to hand it in. And like March, like a month before I'm supposed to hand it in, um, they scrap the whole project. They get rid of the whole imprint and I'm uh, like, well, what am I going to do now? You know? And so I had to start completely from scratch, you know? And then, um, then it was a matter of like finding a new suitor. And it wasn't until January, 2017. And mind you, now it's rejected, 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 rejected. And it was, I mean, it had been rejected like five times and some people are like, oh, it's angry, you know, it's this, it's that, and it's, you know, and it wasn't until January, 2017, 
that I met was Andrew Eliopoulos from HarperCollins, and he and Rosemary Bronson absolutely loved it. They saw exactly what I was trying to do. Um, so I signed a contract, and then it took me from January 2017 until February 2018, like starting drawing at 9 a.m., finished drawing at 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. um, almost every day for 13 months. I handed it in February of 2019. And then the worst thing ever, you had to take a, it took a year for it to come out, you know? And I had had so many things over the years come this close only to fall apart that I didn't even tell anyone, you know, like I had a deal for like a 40 card mama's boys, uh, greeting cards from American greetings. And I thought I had that and that fell apart. And then I was going to have this daily syndicated comic strip through King features and that fell apart. And I had this other thing. It's like, this looks good. And that fell apart. And then, like I said, Andrew McNeil didn't want it. So I just, I didn't tell anybody because I'm like, I don't believe that this is actually going to happen. And it literally wasn't until somebody saw the Publishers Weekly release. And then they were like, oh my God, Jerry Craft, congratulations. And they tagged me in it. And then I was like, okay, I think this might really happen. And then I retweeted it, but I didn't tell anyone besides like, immediate family and a few really close friends um and then it came out in february 5th 2019 i had the cover blur from jeff kenny which is amazing and it's then a beautiful that was it, moment you know yeah and then when i saw we reconnected because um when they started sending me out in october of 2019 it was um or 2018 right 2018 because if i think hey kiddo, 2018, hey, kiddo. right before it came out yeah. yes yeah. yeah 2018 and that was neba and neighbor new england independent bookseller association and north america Ind independent bookseller association a lot of acronyms a lot of acronyms yes. in the world yes. of children's publishing and and that's also something that um, not not as many people know about. I mean, everyone sort of has a general idea of what a book tour might be, right? You, you tour around to bookstores right. and you sign books, but that pre-publication blitz is really important. And yes. and for about two or three months, yeah, you and I were at so many different events, Everything. eating rubber chicken, you know, uh, and and um you know, sort of greasing the wheels for these two books, which uh, for, for you and I, you know, our, our, our respective books were both sort of, I don't want to say a gamble, but we knew we, we, I knew I had a lot writing on Hey Kiddo because it was very different yes. based on everything you've just told me. And it, and man, you talk about emotional turmoil in those years, a decade plus leading up to New Kid publishing. So now that we know the full depth of what you had been through how did you sleep the night before new kid published you know like i just really didn't know what to expect you know because again like i always just wanted to do black kids as just regular kids you know mm -hmm. without the weight of the world on their shoulders but I didn't see a lot of books like that. So was it like kids didn't read them so they didn't make them or they didn't make them because kids didn't read them? Like, I didn't know what, you know, it was it the chicken or the egg, you know, which came first. And so I, I, I thought kids would like it. I didn't know if it would get critical acclaim. Um, yeah, I just, I just really didn't know. And then um, I remember this woman, uh, now friend Tildy, I went on Instagram one day and I got tagged and it was like, 
oh my goodness, I read the best book. I can't wait for it to come out. I'm like, well, why is she tagging me in this? And I looked and she had like literally, I think HarperCollins had like Xerox copies. This is before the advanced reader copy even came out. They made like Xerox copies and gave them out at some uh, fair or book fair or, you know, weekend retreat. And she absolutely loved it. And that to me was like my first review. I was like, oh, somebody read it and they liked it. And it was like, wow, okay. And then, like I said, I met you again. We reconnected at Neba Neba. And I had to sign like 130 copies of the Rand's Vita copy. And I had these like black Sharpies. I was like, hey, black Sharpies, that's cool. <laughs> and then, you know, I get the book. And it's like all like black end papers. Oh, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, the book has black end papers. So you invested in all of those black sharpies, only to then have to go into silver sharpies. Yeah, and it would, <laughs> and uh, so, and there was the advanced reader copy. So I literally had to sign in a pink marker on the very last page. That was like the only white in the whole book. That is and some exclusive look on eBay right now for those. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, Anika Denise was like, uh, you want to borrow one of my silver markers? I was like, yes, please. <laughs> you know, and so then I could sign like the last 20 in silver. But up until then, everything was like the last page. Um, and then I went to Winter, Winter Institute, which was in... Um, which we should say is an, an event for, for booksellers, right? Independent booksellers. Also, in, like nationwide. Mm -hmm. That was in like... New Mexico or, or Albuquerque, I think. And then I really started meeting like real authors. I took a selfie with Kobe Bryant holding the book. And wow. so that was kind of cool. And then the book came out at a very small launch. It was like Porter Square Books in Boston. Um, a couple other up in that area. I did like a Cambridge library and then I went to like DC and fell off via Brooklyn. And like, that was it. That was my line. And then just slowly, but you know, steady, steady, steady. Like the word started getting out and I got like five star reviews and then it was just like, phew. yeah. And it was just full steam ahead after that. And, and, and you worked so hard on getting behind the book to promote it because, you know, in the before times, especially you had to, you had to go the places. And I think that's still important and it will be the future of getting word out for your books. But I think there is, I think there was a two month stretch where you and I were at a different event, book fair. Like I would see you every weekend for like two months. And then I had with yes. withdrawal because I was like, I, I haven't seen Jerry Craft in a while. And then the, the pandemic hit and um, it, and everything shut down, of course. But, uh, you know, you broke down so many barriers on so many levels. Uh, you know, the, the fact that you saw such a desperate need to have books with young black protagonists that's about their joy and that you wanted to make graphic novels and comics and, and you combined every every piece of your essence to, to give us new kid and then it won the newberry medal the the, the award for writing and, and the credit scott king medal for writing uh you must have been stunned what was what was that like? What was like what was it like getting that phone call to not only that you would get that prestigious award, but you would be the first to break that barrier to get a graphic novel into that stratosphere of of prestige in children's literature. Oh, did you not hear me? Hold on. Sorry. hold on yes okay i think i froze for a second hold on one second let me plug this back in i'll ask my question again okay. uh, 
I didn't think you still got nervous after all these years. No, I, uh, no, I think we're still froze. I don't hear you at all now. Do you hear me? Hear me now. Now. Now you can hear me? Yes. Okay. So you, you, you broke down so many barriers, uh, you know, that you, sorry, now my son is, is jumping upstairs. <laughs> you, you broke down so many barriers on, on so many levels. So one, uh, you saw just that, that need, that desperate need to have black protagonists, young black protagonists that were experiencing joy and their lives. And it was, it's about their joy and, 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 and not the pain of, of their dealing with racism and what their ancestors endured. Uh, and then you broke another barrier of having a graphic novel win the prestigious Newbery Medal, an award for writing in the library community where, you know, librarians of yesteryear would not let a comic book into their space, as well as the Coretta Scott King Medal for writing. So your heart must have been racing when your phone started ringing and these, these award committees were calling you to say, guess what? You're, you're, you're changing history with this. What was, what kind of, what, that must've been such a head trip. What was that even, I, what was that even like? Yeah. You must still be processing it. It, it does take a lot to process, you know, like first I got to say, so it's Belmont and Porter Square Books. Those are where I launched. I just wanted to thank them again. Um, yeah, you know, like there were a lot of um, schools that were doing mock Newberries. And New Kid did pretty well in mock Newberries. But I knew that it would because there were kids voting. But I wasn't sure that adults would vote for it. You know, one, it just was going against the grain of history. You know, only four African-American authors had ever won Newberry in 100 years. Mm -hmm. Like even to this day, four had ever won. Kwame Alexander, Virginia Hamilton, Christopher Paul Curtis, and Mildred Taylor. So, you know, that was a long shot from that perspective. And then no uh, graphic novel had ever won. And, you know, there are some great graphic novels, Hey Kiddo included, American Born Chinese by Gene Yang, which is very influential to show just how much I felt I could push it. Uh, Victoria's Roller Girl, um, Cece Bell's El Defo, you know, David Small Stitches, those are like some of my favorites. And of course, you know, Raina, who was just Raina, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, like, it was nice to, to just be in the conversation, you know, like, that would be one of my, like, you know, as a grandfather, you know, I... I, uh, I did really well on that mock Newberries one year and, you know, at times, and then, you know, more and more people started saying, and then I started like looking at the school library journals, the heavy metal countdown, you, you know, and now I'm like watching like, you know, people on uh, YouTube giving their Newberry predictions uh, and no one was predicted. And, uh, to this day, I call up and tease a few of them, but that's, you know, that's <laughs> there. 642 AM, the phone ring, and I normally turn off my phone because I work such late hours, but I had always heard that the phone rings at some ghastly hour of the morning, anywhere from like 3 AM to 7 AM. And so I, at like 630, I was like, oh, well, it was a good run, so I went back to sleep. And then at 6.42, the phone rings, and all I could think of is, man, if this is a credit card offer, somebody is gonna get hurt really bad. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> and know, you are I... such a gentle soul, so it's going to take a lot to. Oh yeah, that, to, to that would have been bad. <laughs> and I was like, "Is this Jerry Craft?" Like, yes. Oh my God, we want to let you know that you've won the Newberry Medal. I did what? Like what now? You won the Newberry Medal, like. And, you know, so I wasn't screaming, like, I was just, like I'm doing now, like. Stunned. Wow. Wow. Okay. Okay, wow. You know? And then the hardest thing ever is like, okay, we're not going live until nine, so don't tell anyone. I'm like, I, I've got to sit on this secret for three hours, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And then I just, you know, laid back down, my heart pumping. And then a half hour later, the phone rings again. And I'm like, I'm thinking, hi, is this Jerry Craft? Yeah, oh, we're so sorry. You know, we, we thought we were calling Jerry Pinkney. So <laughs> we're going we to eat it for you, you know? And it was like, I, I had no idea what this next call was because there weren't any mock Coretta Scott King awards. So I hadn't even equated the two. I didn't think I was even in that, you know, in that realm. And I said, is this Jerry Craft? I'm like, yeah. We want to let you know that you've won the Coretta Scott King author award. Wow. <laughs> that kind of thing. It's like, wow. And then, you know, a few months prior, I had won the Kirkus Award, and that was like weird because, you know, Harper wasn't even going to send me to that. You know, like I heard I was nominated, and I talked to my editor, like, "Hey, Andrew, we going to that?" He's like, "Man," I'm like, "Oh, okay." So I booked all like, all these school visits, and then um, he calls it. Yeah, my boss, you know, Rosemary says we should definitely go. I'm like, okay, and I didn't prepare, and then I'm on the plane going there. I was like. What if I win? I said, you know, let me jot down some notes just in case, you know? And so winning that was the first thing that I was like, wow, this is legit, you know? Yeah. Um, and then winning those two and then, you know, hearing, like not knowing that no graphic novel had won, not knowing only four African-American authors had won, not knowing that no book had won those and the Kirkus. I'm like, are you kidding me? So the kid whose teachers told him that comic books were stupid and not real reading grows up to do the comic that legitimizes the format as real reading. You know, it was like, you know, Anakin bringing um, balance to the forest, except you know, <laughs> without the violence. You know, then they're killing people on the, you know, that whole thing. But, you know, it was just really... Uh, a lot and because i wasn't a reader i hadn't grown up with that newberry you know like i know yeah. an oscar and an emmy and a, but i remember my friend donna calling me in tears because she loved newberry books and so it got her she's like oh my god you won i'm like oh you know of this she's like of course i know of this i'm like oh okay so it took six months for everything to kind of sink in. Um, and it, it still does every once in a while. Like now I meet adults who are like nervous around me, which, you know, you know how you and I goof around. Like that's the last thing that I think that someone is going to be like nervous and, yes. you know, shaking as they try to take a selfie. And, you know, and then I remember talking to a, a librarian she said, you don't understand. Like, you guys are our rock stars. I'm like, really? Okay. I'm like, if you knew me and Jared back in high school, you <laughs> <laughs> no, we were... and also, that would be the last thing I'm sure either of us. That's where you would, have to would also hear. Say, like, you know, you, know? you don't understand. Like, I know so well what it's like to sit at a table with a pile of my books and have people pick it up put it back down, smile politely, and walk on with another, <laughs> with another word. <laughs> I remember um, 
going to NCTE, another acronym, National Council of Teachers of English. And, you know, I had always gone to those things as a fan, you know, and I would get like the, the program and I would go through it with a highlighter, like, okay, 12 to 1, Elizabeth Acevedo and Renee Watson. 1 to 2, Eric Velasquez and, you know, Brian Collier. You know, 3 to 4, Jason Reynolds, like that kind of thing. And so now for the first time I was going to these and I'm sitting in the audience and then the people next to me, I see them nudging each other and doing like, you know, like, <laughs> look who we're sitting next to. And I was like, oh, wow. And then the weirdest thing with NCTE, like I was supposed to sign copies of New Kid at say like one in the afternoon. And I get there early and there is a line that's blocking my table. And I'm thinking, doggone it, if they book Jeff Kenny and you know, <laughs> my fans gotta like jump through like roller derby or Ring Olivia, you know, a Red Rover, you know, trying to get to me. <laughs> I'm like, why would they do this? You know, why would they book someone with this long line that's going to block my table? And I go, I'm kind of cranky now, you know, because I was like all into it. And um, I go to the woman at the end of the line and I'm like, I'm like, hi, excuse me, ma'am. Um, who are you guys here to see? She goes, we're here to see you. I was like, this is my line? Yeah. I'm like, Oh, that's amazing. Ah, okay, and so yeah, it, it just took a long time to, you know, for it, for all that stuff to sink in. And that then that's how you became an overnight success, right? Yeah, the <laughs> right. I mean, it it's still sinking in because, like, so I won the Newberry in January, and then the world shut down due to COVID in March. So, like, I didn't get to give my speeches in person. And I had trips like to China and um, Dubai and all these places, Hawaii that I had to cancel. So I've still not really been in person, you know. You, so. Yeah, you have you 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 were robbed of the experience of having that immediate in person celebration. And and mark my word, you're still gonna get it. And if that's just well, you know, so weird, me, like Jeff Kenny, like throwing you a party, we will. But well, um, they didn't need, they didn't even do the uh, the ALA Newberry poster the year I won. So they've got the one there. before me, and then they did the one after where I'm in second, but not the one that's like, hey, here's new kid. I'm like, dude, you, you didn't do my poster, you know, I got a spot on my, my wall next to my read poster, you know, that I, yeah. I was saving. Um. But yeah, it's it's just been surreal. Now, the good thing about the lockdown is I was able to finish the um, the companion book class act in like record time because I didn't leave the house. You know, like we would go out once a week to buy groceries and then come back and, you know, put plastic over the windows, <laughs> you know, for like eight months. So I, yeah, where it took maybe maybe two years to do new kid. I did class act in like eight months. And is, is there, have you been spending more time making a third book in the series? Yeah. So I'm about halfway through the third book. Oh, that's um, and I, I draw it all digitally, like right here. This is my, uh, my Wacom and tools pro with the stylus. And that's how I do. I've done all three books drawing in uh, Adobe Photoshop. You know, I, 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 I would bet your third new kid will probably come out around the time the companion book for Hey Kiddo. So Sunshine was supposed to be out, but with everything happening and I just didn't have the right headspace because graphic memoir, memoir is hard. Um, so, you know, if our books come out at the same time and the world's open, 
um, we should go on a we should go just go on book tour together. Yeah, we do new kiddo part the two, block. the new, new kiddo, kiddo on tour. The block now that we know that you did right it. there, you go. <laughs> so there I'll you go. I'll work on the choreography. Okay. And okay, uh, and I'll, I'll do the lyrics. Perfect. Look, we are all better off that Jerry Craft continued to work hard and work through that pain of rejection, work through that pain of have having projects fall through. Uh, and, and you followed your passions. You wrote the book that you wish you had. You you wrote the book you wish your kids had. Uh, and and the world benefits from that. We all benefit from that. And and thank you so much for everything you are, Jerry Craft. I appreciate you so much. I miss you. I'm glad that we get to text and jump on the phone sometimes to talk about this crazy, bizarro career we chose to jump into. Uh, but thank thank God we're here and thank God we have, you know, uh, those librarians who are putting stickers on graphic novels, those librarians who are putting graphic novels on those shelves. And now more than ever, thank God for those those librarians and classroom teachers who are who are standing up to the bullies, those yeah. the short sighted people who are saying pull these books, and and the librarians do that not because they think we're cool, they do it for the same reasons we do and fight because we love the kids that we serve, and yeah, and we absolutely. fight for the kids that we serve, uh, so I'm not going to take up any any more of your time because you probably have to get get back on that deadline. I'm working till 3 a.m. <laughs> God bless you, man. Thank, Thank you, sir. All right, buddy. I miss you, man. See you soon. You got it.